Hello. I'm going to be reading Art Forum tonight. It's one of those magazines that's very chic, very slick, very glossy. The glossiest, in a way, of all the art magazines, because this is the one that's the magazine of the avant-garde. Not the real avant-garde, not the really happening young people, but the bourgeois avant-garde. The avant-garde that's got it made and got enough together to be in these very glossy pages that mark Art Forum. Art Forum isn't read by people who shop at Sears. The people who read Art Forum are the same people who would think of wearing the Japanese fashions that they sell in the new boutiques in Soho. They're mainly artists, uh, art students, people who are related to the art world, collectors of contemporary art, and some people who are pretty rich. The, the magazine says that the audience is middle class, people with a, an income of twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars. But for the most part, I think the split comes into people who have more money and critics and artists and people who have very little. I first encountered the magazine when I was an art student in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And at that time, this was 1970, and in 1970, almost all the art you could see was not only very abstract, but very, very minimally abstract. And I was an art student, and I was going to school, and what we did as art students in Milwaukee, which is very far from New York, was to read the art magazines. That was the first thing they told us. They told us, you have to read the art magazines and figure out from the art magazines what it is that you're supposed to paint in your next class how it is that you're supposed to approach this whole subject. So the magazine that was the Bible, the magazine that was God in those days was Art Forum. And so we all got our, bought our copies and we took them home and we read Art Forum. And it was terrible because we couldn't understand anything in it. And we started to read the articles and it was just total gibberish. So I thought at that time, and most of us thought that it was because we were really stupid that we couldn't understand the kind of writing that Art Forum had in it. But later on, I got older, I worked as an artist for many years, and I found out that I still couldn't understand the writing in Art Forum. And in fact, sometimes I think nobody either understands the writing in Art Forum in some of the articles, or even reads them. Because in a way, that's not the point. The point is to talk about some kind of art that ought to be talked about. And sometimes there's not very much to say about that kind of art, because the art itself is really very simple. And you can't talk for very many pages about something that's simple and make it sound complicated and somehow marvelous if you talk about it in straight English. And so people will write stories in these magazines that take off from straight English and are kind of works of fictional art. And these things serve, in a real sense, to justify this is a work of art, to legitimize it, to make it important, to make it worthwhile, to make it valuable, to make it something that collectors want to have in their collections, to make it a movement that people want to put in art history books, to make it fetch a hundred, two hundred, half a million dollars at an auction at Sotheby's. But let me show you an example of this kind of writing. Um, the first pages here are always filled with ads, and the ads in art form are very elegant, mainly black and white. But the first story is about, it's called Chasing Dreams, Victor Hitchcock and Alfred Bergen. And it's about an exhibition of conceptual art, of photographs of Alfred Hitchcock's vertigo, transposed by the artist to have certain other meanings. But this is the way the author, Jean Fisher, writes about it. To what may we attribute our fascination for the image, a pleasure whose object is not the image itself, but something of the order of phantasm, whose home is that realm of the inscrutable, the unconscious? It is among the perversities of the Alfred Hitchcock film that it allows us a glimpse of that which is not readily visible, as a shadow passing across a veil. 
Of all the director's films, it is Vertigo, obsessive, subterranean, and fabulous, which is constructed around this psychic fascination. It is this tension of something perpetually sought, but which continually hovers only at the periphery of vision that becomes resurrected in Victor Bergen's recent work, The Bridge. And then to move on just a little bit, she says, both auteurs are rigorous formalists. Like Hitchcock, Bergen is notorious for a seemingly tight control of the mise en scène, always use a foreign word whenever possible, in order to achieve maximal photographic effect. This is more than simply audience manipulation. It means an attention to the way that the institution of the photograph and of the cinema, of the image machine, their formal, cultural, and historical formations, conjoins with the psychical apparatus of the spectator to produce a meaning effect. Well, Hitchcock never was very uh, confusing to me. I could always understand him very easily. But I have much more problems with uh, what the author does to Hitchcock's work. The next part of the magazine is something about um, German Expressionism, and then uh, a story by actually an interview with an artist called Chuck Close who does, uh, does photographically realist things. And in fact, that's the cover photograph. And it talks about process and shows different manipulations in beautiful, beautiful color of what he's done. Then we get to an article on architecture that's called, and this time I couldn't even get past the title, The Death of Semiotics in Late Modern Architecture, The Corruption of Metaphor in Postmodernism, The Birth of the Punctum in Neomania. Now I was kind of curious what the punctum means. So. Uh, then the article is a real academic kind of article with lots and lots of quotes by lots and lots of important people scattered through it. Um, people from various countries, Paolo Portuguese, uh, Alan Colocum, and especially Roland Barthes, who is uh, the god of semiologists. And finally, he gets to the punctum. It says, if the Marquette building is an early clue to the resolution of our riddle, Roland Barthes' final pair of books are the last. A lover's in A Lover's Discourse, he comes dangerously close to endowing language with extraterritorial claims. In Camera Lucida, he deserts structural analysis entirely. Instead of probing for the public signification that results from the photograph, he resolves instead upon a private quest. If each photograph is based on a general and objective field of discourse apparent to every viewer, the studium, it is violated or punctured time and again by a private meaning, parentheses. This element which rises from the scene shoots out of it like an arrow and pierces me, end quote. Since this punctum is entirely solipsistic in nature, Barthes' reading of his mother's death in an early portrait, for example, it revolutionizes the meaning of photography, heretofore considered the most public of mediums. And that's exactly, in a sense, what this magazine and what a lot of art criticism do, is to take what might be public and understood by a general public and make it something that only a very few, a very elite group of people can understand and appreciate. And it's a whole process of mystification that's engaged in not just by Art Forum, but by basically all the art magazines, to maintain a certain value, a certain quality in art that makes it a commodity that's worth um, the investment and makes it a kind of a status symbol that only a few, the very educated, can appreciate and everyone else more or less has to guess and grope about. Now, what's the relationship between uh, the texts and the advertising in a magazine like Art Forum? There are art magazines that run a lot of reviews in which there's almost a one-to-one -one relationship. If you buy an ad, you get coverage. 
But when you do that kind of thing, the value isn't there. The value that the art magazines bestow on the work of art, bestow on the artist, is to give it a value that's beyond the commercial. And if it looks like it's commercial, if it looks like it's bought, if it looks like it's vanity, then it doesn't really do any good. So in a magazine like Art Forum, which is a classy magazine, there is no one-to-one -one relationship. It's the same kinds of things that are talked about as the advertising in the front of the magazine. in the galleries here? Mm-hmm. Yes. Do you come often? Well, this is my first time in the 41st year that I come here to New York to see art galleries, okay? And I come about 5,000 miles away. I guess I didn't count. Uh, tell me, do you read any of the art magazines or writing about art? Mm, yes, I read art in America, art, uh, art news, and... Uh, some architectural magazines have uh, something about art too, okay? What else? Uh, you don't read Art Forum? Uh, art Forum? Oh yes, I had I get it at uh, home, yeah. Sure, I forgot. Mm -hmm. What do you think of Art Forum? To tell you the truth, the list, <laughs> the list <laughs> of them, I don't like it. Why don't you like it? Why do I, I, I see you are from Art Forum, right? <laughs> No. I tell you why, because it's too sophisticated and too less about art and too much about blah, blah, blah. We're trying to find out why people read the magazines and what they find out in them. I think probably the people that read the magazines are not the people that should. I think the people that read the magazines are probably either critics or artists or people that know too much about art. And uh, the people that should read the magazines are people that need help going and experiencing art. It's like I saw the show at the Modern and so much of it was about... I read this one thing, I think it was New York Magazine, and it was uh, so much of art today is informational. It's like, yeah, I get it, go on to the next thing. Yeah, I get it, go on. As opposed to really wanting to like study something and just be with, be with something and experience it, you know? Yeah. That's one of the problems of so much art, art writing, writing and writing and writing about art. I don't know. I think it's a very small circle. I think that my uh, Uncle Bob in Minnesota should know about art, but I don't think he does. What do you think of Art Forum as a magazine? I don't know. I think it's... Uh, I don't know. I can speak about the articles, the art article. I don't know if they are good or not. I never read it. <laughs> I think there's a lot of advertisements. It looks to me to be an advertising uh, place for galleries and museum and so on, mostly. Why, what in particular do you like about it? It's, um, it's a very clear way of showing the work. It's, uh, there's not much around it. It's rather clear cut. And I think, as far as I can trace it down, the colors are quite accurate so what about the text nice format as i said i don't read the text <laughs> <laughs> it seems like a lot of the critics are writing more about the parties that go on and and their friends like sort of name dropping rather than being just like um objective about the art itself and really writing about the you know what's behind the art and where it's coming from. But it's generally a really good magazine. It just seems a little too flimsy sometimes lately. When I say that Art Forum is a magazine of the avant-garde, 
it's important to understand exactly what the avant-garde is. This is the turf that Art Forum has staked out for itself. And what it means is that it has to be this little group of people who are the vanguard doing things, doing the important new things, but it also means that it's supposed to be rebellious. It's supposed to be in some way misunderstood and against the establishment. And this means that there's a certain amount of room within that whole concept for some very good things and for some very bad things. And so Art Forum has always carried a certain amount of criticism of the art world. It carries um, articles, for example, there was an editorial about artists' call against intervention. There was um, criticism of the commercialization of the art world. And even for a short period in the history of Art Forum, there was a so-called Marxist regime. It didn't last very long. It happened in the mid-70s. And uh, for a period there, uh, well, Art Forum started out, see, as the, the mouthpiece in a sense of minimal art. And when minimal art faded and all this kind of stuff just wasn't very exciting anymore, what was it going to do? It began to move into other directions and began to move for a while into talking about the sociology of art and carrying uh, a lot of articles that dealt with uh, the, the museums, the, uh, carried this famous article by Max Kozlov on uh, the Cold War uses of art. And uh, Kozlov and John Coplins, who were the editors, turned the magazine more and more toward a direction that was a kind of a muckraking um, approach to the art world. And they finally, in December 1975, came out with an issue, this particular issue of the magazine, that was so controversial that it was attacked by Hilton Kramer in the New York Times and uh, began what became the end of the little Marxist phase. It had articles, each of them kind of sociological approaches to art. There was one on Steichen's war images, on another one on uh, television, one on David, on the age of revolution that was a sociological approach to that, um, and even an article on people's art in China. Well, the attack that Hilton Kramer made in the New York Times against this emphasis on photography and uh, sociological Marxism, we called it muddled Marxism in the arts, uh, had its effect. And uh, a number of big advertisers dropped their accounts with Art Forum and about a year after this issue came out, the editors were fired. That is, John Coplins was fired and Max Kozlov resigned. After that, Art Forum went into um, its perhaps most conservative phase uh, with a very formalist kind of editorial policy and now has a lot of emphasis and a number of issues on feminism and even some very good articles. In this issue, for example, the the May issue, at the end of the issue is a whole series of articles about uh, that same Hilton Kramer who used to be the art critic for the New York Times and now has his own conservative art magazine called The New Criterion. And uh, Kramer uh, was part of the National Endowment for the Arts Review Board. He presented to them the fact that he thought that the critics fellowships should be eliminated because the critics were all anti-American. So uh, this happened. This came to pass just a few months ago. An art forum carries three stories in this issue uh, in a section called Forum by three critics that are critical of art forum. I mean, that are critical of Hilton Kramer and critical of the abolishment of the critics' fellowships. All of the art magazines together form a kind of a a coterie. There are the glossies. In addition to Art Forum, there's Arts, which carries mainly reviews. There's Art News that caters more to the middle American audience and the collectors and carries kind of popularized articles. There's Art in America, which tries to do it all. It carries um, 
all kinds of uh, articles of criticism. It has reviews. It has a little bit of uh, political stuff in the beginnings, usually, in a little black and white section. And then there are the other magazines. Um, there's the really alternative magazines. There's Upfront. That's a little magazine put out by PAD, uh, Art and Artists, Heresies, which is women artists, Fuse, which is, comes out of Canada, Cultural Correspondence, which is a little New York magazine, all of these, New Art Examiner, which is a Chicago magazine, and wrote the exposés on uh, the Art Forum story when the editors were fired. All of these magazines are a whole different realm of the art world. It's really the glossies that manage to form opinion and set the tastes and create the values that create the art business, that pull the whole thing together. Now, if Art Forum is a magazine that people look at but never read, how can that work? And the way that it works is that, to some extent, there's no need to read this magazine. This magazine works perfectly without ever being read, because the important parts of it don't have to be read. You can look at the cover and see who's, who's you know, important this month. OK, this guy is obviously hot. You can look at the pictures and the reviews and see who's being reviewed this month. You can look at who the articles are about. And the graphics are always gorgeous and see what's happening in the art world. And you don't really have to read it. You really don't have to read it. And the writers don't have to write it in a sense it's not important, because they're not really being paid very much, for example. I mean, nobody pays art critics to write art criticism. They're getting paid in a different way and in a different place. And in a sense, the whole ball game is not in what the editorial pages say, but simply in the fact that they exist. Because almost all of these writers who write for the art magazine actually work for a university. Since they work for a university, the fact that they publish is the important fact, not what the publication says. And the ball game is having publications in prestigious magazines so that they can get a raise at the university, not so that they can really make a name as a writer, not so that anyone really reads the writing. So. The whole thing is a kind of a game, and the game is not necessarily where you think it might be. The game is taking place in a number of different spheres, and not necessarily in reading the magazine. And in some ways, that makes sense, because <laughs> it's a visual arts magazine, and artists don't read. And the readers of this magazine are primarily artists. This is, circulation is about 27 to 30,000. And most of that is in New York City, with a lot of it in the West Coast, and about 25% in Europe. And if you look through the ads in the magazine, about 25% of the ads are also coming from Europe. And the fact that it has so much of a European circulation, gives a kind of a cue to the type of people who read the magazine. They're people to whom, if something important is happening in Dusseldorf, it really isn't very different from its happening in Boston. They just get on a plane and go to see where the action is. So the people who read this magazine, the game that this magazine is playing, the whole object of this magazine is not education, not really staking out a part, uh, making important statements about art in the art world, or educating people who don't know about art about the arts. It's a question of validating certain types of art and giving them value, and making certain movements seem to be legitimate, giving value giving credibility, giving legitimacy to art movements, and to the investments that the collectors have made in their collections. 